I was going to say, you did me there, a tough act to follow. I never got that loud of an applause. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. The applause ain't for us anyways, it's for Jesus. Because that's whom she was singing to. But he certainly has blessed her with an amazing voice. Thank you for that, Phoenix. What a perfect segue as we jump into the teaching time of our worship service this morning. And for those of you who were with us last week, and even for those who weren't, we began an Advent series. And we'll be doing that for the next three weeks following today. Five weeks during this Advent season where we look to and anticipate the arrival of our Savior King. And so I've kind of titled this short series, Advent Perspectives, The Different Responses to the Birth of Jesus. And last week we looked at Matthew's response, or I should say Joseph's response, and his experience according to Matthew's account in chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. And this morning we're going to look at Mary from Luke's account. And so you can see I've titled the message this morning, Mary, Faith and Praise. And though we'll specifically be looking at verses 46 to 55, I do want to read just so you have the whole setting, the whole story fresh in your minds, starting in verse 26. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth and to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word, and the angel departed from her. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among young women, women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped to serve in Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. 
Many of us are familiar with the story of the book of Esther in the Old Testament. And the book of Esther and the events recorded in it take place during the reign of King Ahasuerus, also known as Xerxes I, king of Persia, the Medo-Persian Empire, between 486 and 465 BC. Long after the northern kingdom Israel, after the split, was taken into captivity by Assyria in 722 BC. And about a hundred years after the southern kingdom, Judah finally fell to Babylon also in 586 BC. This is a hundred years after that. During that hundred year period, the Babylonians were eventually knocked off by the Medo-Persians and it was them who ruled. King Ahasuerus. And he ruled in the capital city of his kingdom, Susa. And during his reign, one day, his queen, Vashti, decides to throw him a feast. And so he's having a feast and he invites all the royal dignitaries in his court. They're merry, they're drinking, they're having a good time. And then suddenly, he orders his servant to go bring the queen so he can present her to all of his royal dignitaries and show off her beauty to the world. You see, the queen, just like everyone else in his kingdom, was subject to the king's command. And in fact, she could not even enter into his presence unless he summoned her. The servant goes, summons her by order of the king, but she refuses. And the king is furious. He's furious at being humiliated and, and publicly defied by his queen. And so he ends up stripping her of the title of queen, removing the crown, and a search begins throughout the entire Persian Empire, 127 provinces, to find a suitable replacement. And it's almost like a, a beauty pageant now because that seems to be the only criteria. All of his servants scatter throughout the provinces in search of the next candidate who could be the queen, competing for the king's affection and for his choosing. And they search high and low for the most beautiful women in the kingdom. And one day they come across a young woman, formerly known as Hadassah, but going by the name Esther to both disguise her ethnicity as a Jew by order of her uncle Mordecai, who was her caretaker. And the eunuch in charge of the harem sees her, and then he seizes her, takes her into the harem, and she enters into a six-month beautification process like all the other women before they could finally have their chance to appear before the king in hopes of being the winner. The story goes on. You see God's hand of providence carrying forward. She gains favor in the king's harem with the servants, with the leaders. And she finally has her chance and makes her way before the king. And it says the king loved her more than any of the other women. And he chooses her to be his queen. An amazing turn of events in her life. As the story goes on, her uncle Mordecai quickly discovers a plot, a plot on the king's life by two of the palace guards. He reveals the plot to Esther, who reveals it to the king, and these two guards are then executed. And during this time, Esther continues to gain the favor of the king through God's good providence. And the king elevates a Persian captain named Haman to the position of prime minister, basically, the captain of all of Persia's princes. So much so that everyone is ordered even to bow down to him. But Mordecai refuses. He refuses to bow down when he sees him at the king's gate. And when Haman sees his refusal to bow down, he's furious, he's indignant. And he says he wants to kill him. And he wants to kill him and all his people because he knew Mordecai was a Jew. And so he starts plotting, and he starts plotting. 
Mordecai catches wind of this plot, and he knows something needs to be done to protect both him and Esther and their people. And he goes to her, and they come together, and they have a plan. Esther says, I want to throw you a feast. And she throws a feast for the king. And during that feast, he's so pleased with everything that she has prepared for him that he says, make a wish of me. I, I will give you anything you want, up to half of my kingdom. And she says, I do want one thing. My wish is that you come back tomorrow for another feast, and you come back with only Haman. Day goes on. Mordecai passes Haman again at the gate, refuses to bow down to him, and now that's it. Now the annihilation genocidal plan is in full motion. He has his guys concoct and construct gallows, and he says, I'm going to be back after I speak to the king, and I'm going to manipulate him into killing Mordecai, as I also did in getting him to issue a decree to annihilate all of the Jews. But something providential happens again that night. The king can't sleep. He's restless. And he gets up out of his bed, and he starts reading through the Zeusa Chronicle, right, the record of events. And he comes across the name of the man who unfolded the plot against his life, Mordecai. And he says, I got to honor him. And so he does honor him in the morning. He gives him a royal regal robe, a horse, and gifts, and he publicly recognizes him in front of the whole city as the man who saved his life, and so shall it be done and to any man who saves his life, any friend of the king. And so now Haman's stuck. What is he going to do? He can't have the man executed, whom now the king trusts with his very life, under the pretense that he's false, that he's a threat. The day rolls on, and the feast arrives. The king's there, Haman's there, enjoying, having a good time. And again, the king says to Esther this time, your wish is my command. Tell me anything you want up to half of my kingdom, and I will grant it to you. And she says, I do need help. I'm pleading with you to help stop this wicked plan that's in motion to annihilate me. I am a Jew. These are my people. And somebody wants to slaughter us for no good reason. It would be different if they just wanted to imprison us. Perhaps I would have accepted. But I can't let this genocide happen. Help me. The king is indignant. Who would do such a thing to my queen and to her people? And she points him out and says, him, the wicked Haman. And the king is irate now. And in an incredible turn of events, Haman ends up being executed on the very gallows that he constructed for Mordecai to be the same day. And the king takes Haman's ring, the king's signet ring, and he places it on the hand of Mordecai, and he elevates him to Haman's position of the prime minister, second to only him in authority and power in all of his kingdom. And that right there is an amazing theme that runs throughout salvation history on the pages of Scripture. And it's perhaps the most illustrative example of God's sovereign control of it. It's through reversal. An incredible reversal for Esther from a peasant girl to a queen. For Mordecai, who ended up living while Haman ended up dying, hung on the gallows he designed for Mordecai. And for Mordecai, going from a, a nobody in the king's courts to second in power and authority to the king. And for the Jewish people, who ended up destroying their enemies rather than the other way around. And all of this through the sovereign, providential control of God to preserve and to protect his people because of the unconditional promises that he made to Abraham and to David. And that's what we find here this morning. As the motivation for Mary's song of praise, as her response to what God has done for her and for her people in history. He's a God of reversals, who reverses human values and situations and conditions in a way that only he can do. And she praises him for taking her, a lowly country girl, and giving her the blessing and the privilege of birthing and raising the Son of God and Savior of the world, Jesus. 
She praises him for the salvation he'll provide for her and for his people. And she praises him for humbling the self-righteous and the proud and arrogant and exalting and saving the pious poor who humbly come to him in faith. And she praises him for his faithfulness to save Israel, his people, and to keep that promise he made to Abraham, which is a universal blessing and salvation to people from all over the world. And we're not going to focus much on her visit to Elizabeth and her being visited by the angel Gabriel. But there is something that's relevant to our purpose this morning. And you see that in what happens. So the angel Gabriel comes to visit Mary. Don't be afraid, O favored one. God has chosen you. You will conceive in your womb and bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus. He'll be great, called Son of the Most High. Right? Of his kingdom there will be no end. God will give him the throne of his father David. Mary says, impossible. How can this be? I'm a virgin. He says, don't worry about that. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and overshadow you. The child will be holy, the Son of God. And the key is right here in Mary's response to the angel. In verse 38, Mary said, behold... I am the servant of the Lord, that it be to me according to your word, and the angel departed from her. Mary believed. And then she goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth. Whether she believed and had some doubt in her mind with the news that Gabriel had given her, saying, even your cousin in her old age, who was previously barren, has conceived, for nothing is impossible for God. Perhaps she wants to see for herself. So she goes. And you see Elizabeth right away, under the inspiration and direction of the Holy Spirit, knows exactly what's going on here and why the baby leaps in her womb. It's because she knows she's coming bearing the Savior, Messiah of the world. She calls him my Lord. And in verse 45 she says this, Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. See, Mary believed. Mary believed the message of the angel, and Elizabeth confirmed that Mary believed in the message of the angel, which was the promise of God that she would be the one to bear a Savior. Mary had faith. Mary had faith in what God had said he would do. Which is to say, Mary had faith in God's word. And the question is, do you and I have that kind of faith? Do you believe in what God has said in his word? Do you believe what God has said in his word about salvation? Which is to say, do you believe what God has said in his word about the gospel? Do you believe the good news that the angel Gabriel brought to Mary? Because you need to believe it. It's the only way that anyone might be saved. And we see that demonstrated in this model with Mary. She believed in the word of God. As you and I and everyone is called to believe in the word of God. And specifically the word of God about Jesus the good news, the exclusivity of salvation in him, the promise of divine forgiveness in him. It's about belief and faith. And that's the first thing we see in Mary's response to the birth of Jesus and the promise of that. It's faith. She believes it. And as a result of her belief, as a result of her contemplation and meditation on being the one chosen uniquely and singularly to be the mother of Jesus, the Son of God, made flesh. She can't help but burst out in praise. And so she sings this song called Mary's Song. Mary's Song of Praise, the Magnificat, taken from the Latin 
of that word you find there in the first verse, 46, magnifies. And it's exactly what it is. It's a psalm. It's a New Testament psalm where Mary, in remembering what God has done for her and through her and for his people, she bursts out in praise. And listen what she starts to say. Verse 46, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. My soul magnifies. My soul worships. My soul exalts. My soul praises. My soul lifts up the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. There's no significant difference in the changing of those two words there, from my soul to my spirit. They're one of the same, done for emphasis, if anything. No, this isn't Hebrew, but Mary is Jewish. And if it's a psalm, it's written in that same kind of a style, right? Parallelism, which is one of the key features of the Old Testament psalms, where you have one line and the second line that says almost the same thing as the first line in slightly different poetic terms for merely nothing more than emphasis. And that's what she's saying. And what's interesting is an amazing parallel that you find. Her song of praise is filled with Old Testament allusions to Scripture, which show just how astute this young lady was with the Old Testament Scriptures. She carried it and treasured it deep with her in her heart. I don't think she had copies of scrolls with her in her house, in her lowly, poor estate. I think she memorized what she'd heard, and she held it here in her heart. And the greatest allusion is to another song of praise in the Old Testament. That's Hannah's song in 1 Samuel 2. The first verse is almost identical. If you turn to 1 Samuel 2, you can see just how similar they are. She says, my heart exalts in the Lord. I rejoice in your salvation. Almost the exact same thing. It could be that Mary, on her way to visit Elizabeth in that four-day journey from Nazareth to that little town in the countryside in Judea, perhaps she was meditating on that. She was thinking back to examples of God's mercy and grace in redemptive history, and she thought back to Hannah, who was in a similar position, barren, unable to conceive, praying for a child. And God answered her prayer and opened her womb, and so she, she praises him for answering her prayers for a son. And her son, Samuel, was used mightily as well, right, as a prophet, as an anointer of kings, Saul and David. Maybe she had that on her mind, which is why you see the similarities. Maybe she had other Old Testament texts on her mind, no doubt, but her point is she's declaring God to be great. And it's clear that Mary resonates with Hannah's exaltation at the birth of her son, with the psalmist in Psalm 35, 9, with the expectation that God will contend against his enemies, and even with Habakkuk's prayer in 3.18 that God will mightily save his people. You see this throughout her song of praise. And I don't know if you caught this part in specific in verse 47. You can't miss this part. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. She's taken hold of God as her personal, my Savior. Which means that Mary recognized she was a sinner. All right? Mary did not conceive of herself immaculately to put that bizarre notion to bed. We looked a little bit last week at the perpetual virginity of Mary. Right? When we looked at Joseph's perspective, according to Matthew's account in, in chapter 1, verses 18 to 25, and we saw from there and from other key texts in the Gospels that Mary had other children who were Jesus' half-brothers and half-sisters. So she did not remain a virgin perpetually. And in the same way here, we see Mary's own recognition of her sinfulness and of her need of a Savior by her own admission. And so that bizarre Roman Catholic church doctrine 
of the Immaculate Conception of Mary, which teaches that when she was conceived in her mother's womb, God, through his grace, protected her, intervened divinely, and kept her from original sin so that she was born with a sinless human nature, which she then passed on to Jesus so that he has a sinless human nature from Mary, not from God. But that's not what the New Testament teaches. You won't find any support for that kind of a teaching in the New Testament. Starting with Mary herself. Let alone teaching that she's co-redemptrix with Jesus. No, she says, I'm no redeemer. I'm a sinner. I'm in need of a redeemer and of a savior. And God has graciously chosen me to be the vessel by which he will come down and be born among men and women to save them. Why exactly is she so filled with praise and with joy? Well, she explains in verse 48. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. What does she mean he has looked on the humble estate of his servant? He has seen me in my low station in life as an insignificant, nothing, nobody, young country girl from a small town in the middle of nowhere in Galilee called Nazareth that nobody of consequence in Judea or Jerusalem would have even heard of. And he has seen me and chosen me specifically for this most highest of blessings and callings to be the mother of the Savior of the world. How can I not praise him as a result of that, she's saying. And everyone will know that, right? From generation to generation, all people from all places and stations and facets in life from now on will look back and know that I have been singularly blessed by God. He is mighty. And he has done great things for me. Indeed, he has. She praises and worships God for what he's done for her. But she also praises and worships God for what and who he is. And if we stop for a minute and think again on what he's done for her and how insignificant she was in her own mind and in the minds of everyone in her society that day, I think we can all relate to that. If you look at who God has chosen, he didn't choose a queen to be the bearer of his son and the savior. He chose a country girl who had nothing and who came from nowhere. And that's just God's pattern of reversing all human values and purposes in a way according to his perfect wisdom to accomplish what he sets out to accomplish. It's similar to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 to 31, and how God, in his infinite wisdom, manages to flip everything that we hold as wise, as valuable in this world backwards and on its head to shame the wise, to bring down the proud, and to exalt the humble. He says, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? 
Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards, not many were powerful, not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that human being might not boast in the presence of God. And because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast only in the Lord. Do you see the reversal that's taking place here? Mary and you and I and every other person who is humble enough to recognize that they are a sinner, wicked, totally separated and cut off from God and desperately needing salvation, we are nobody. We are nothing. We weren't the wisest. We weren't the most intellectual. We didn't have position in society, status, wealth, power. We're not the influential. He says we're the bottom of the pan and the lowest rung, and yet God intended to do it that way all along to put his glory on full display so that by human wisdom nobody could ascend to him and understand how he works in such a mysterious and glorious way to exalt the humble and to humble the proud. What a reversal. That's who he's chosen. There was nothing in and of ourselves that merited to be chosen by God. You see that right there. Paul puts himself in that category. As brilliant and as lofty and mightily used by God as you think Paul is, he says, I'm at the bottom of the rung along with you in the eyes of the world. But God chose. He chose him. And he chose Mary. And he chose you. And he chose me. And if we know on our own, without his divine choosing to set his saving love on us, we would never know him and be in right relationship with him and have the hope of eternity in him by belief in his son as our Lord and as our Savior. If that's not reason to exult with praise and with joy and to magnify his name, I don't know what is. And so Mary's song is our song. We appropriate her praise because we see ourselves in her shoes as nobody, but somebody to God. Somebody worth dying for to God. And she continues her song, moving from praising God for what he's done for her to praising God for who he is. Look at verse 49. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name, and his mercy is for those who fear him. She's praising him for his power, his awesome power, and the great things he's done for her and for her people, his people, throughout redemptive history. And because his name is holy, which means he is holy. See, names today don't have as much significance as they did back then in ancient society. Back then, a name was everything. A name said a lot about you. Inherent in your name was your character and your nature and your virtues. And off the bat, she recognizes God is holy. Fundamentally, as a part of who he is, God is holy. And he has power. He's mighty to do all things. And his mercy is for those who fear him. He's a merciful and gracious God to all those who revere him enough to humbly submit to him as Lord and bow the knee. He grants mercy to those. And God's mercy truly is from generation to generation, which means always for everyone. But only for those who revere him. You see the qualification there. If we're talking about eternal mercy, which is to say divine forgiveness of sin, not everyone receives that mercy from God. 
And the reason they don't receive that mercy from God is because they don't revere him. They won't submit to him. They won't bend the knee to him as God and as Lord. But that's the only way to receive his mercy. Look, his mercy is available abundantly and infinitely in the cross of his son, Jesus Christ, whom we're celebrating and whom Luke is telling the story of right here, but only if you revere him. You can have access to the mercy of God all you want, but you must bend the knee to God and God in human flesh, Jesus Christ. That's the sole requirement for receiving the mercy of God. Because he's holy. He's merciful. He's gracious. He's compassionate. He's full of loving kindness. And he's ready and willing to extend this benevolent mercy. But she says he's also holy. And if he's holy, that means he can't tolerate sin. And he must punish sin. And he has punished sin. And the person of the incarnate Son of God. And you can have your sin punished in him too if you come to him by faith. But one way or another, as a holy God, he must punish sin. But that's the way to access the mercy of God. By faith and by faith in his son alone. But not only that, she doesn't just praise God for the amazing reversal of her life and her experience of, of salvation, of forgiveness, of being bestowed this lofty honor and singular privilege of being the mother of Jesus. She doesn't just praise him for who he is, which is reason enough to praise him. But she also praises him in remembering his mercy towards his people. Look at verse 51. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has scattered the proud. Who are the proud? Those who are self-sufficient in their own minds. It's not just actions he's talking about here. He says, in the thoughts of their own hearts. He has left them in confusion and the lies and deception of the wicked and selfish and proud and arrogant and haughty thoughts in their own hearts. He's left them in that. They're a mess. Their thoughts and their minds are scrambled. They think they have it all together. Because what are they thinking? I don't need God. I'm good enough without God. I am God and the Lord of my own life. I refuse to bow the knee and to surrender to this sovereign God and to his son, my Savior, Jesus as Lord. I'm not going to bow down to him. I don't need him. They're proud. They're arrogant. And not only in their thinking about themselves, the self-perception, but in their perception of others. They view others. The, the lowly, the insignificant, the poor. They view them as less, as subhuman, as not having as much worth and importance as them. That's the thinking of the proud. And God says, don't think for a second that justice won't befall them. It's not the proud and the mighty and the rulers here who are going to have the last word. No, God is going to have the last word. And he will vindicate and he will execute perfect justice. And he continues to say that. Look at verse 52. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. Another reversal. He's not saying that it's going to be a reversal where he topples the current rulers and the monarchs and the mighty, and they're replaced with the poor and the lowly, so that they can then continue a cycle of oppression and get proud in who they are in their position and in their property and in their power. No, that's not what he's talking about here. He's saying... 
He brings down those who are proud and who are arrogant and mighty, even rulers in this life who refuse to understand that they are created in the image of God and are called to worship God and that proper and true worship can only happen through faith in the Son of God by recognition that they are sinners and in need of a Savior. He's evening the playing field here is what he's doing. He's saying it doesn't matter if you're high and lofty and a ruler or if you're low and poor. Unless you come by way of faith, you're not coming at all. You can't buy your way into heaven. You can't boast your way into heaven. You can't build your way into heaven. You can't make any way at all. And your best foot forward. And the humble know that, he's saying. That's real humility. It's not easy to admit that you're a wretch. It's not easy to admit to yourself that in and of yourself, with your human nature, being born into sin and inheriting that sin from Adam, including Mary, it's not easy to admit that you are wicked, evil, and left to your own devices, which you and I both know the thoughts that are, you're capable of, let alone the actions that you're capable of doing. But it's not easy to admit that, is it? Certainly not to others. That's what the humble do. That's humility. In fact, that's the first step towards salvation, isn't it? It's admission. It's repentance. It's, it's confession. It's acknowledgement of your sinfulness and total depravity being cut off from God, saying, I desperately need you to save me. There is nothing I could ever do. There's no way I could ever earn your forgiveness. I look in the mirror every single day, and I know my own sinfulness. I know just what I'm capable of. That's humility. But for whoever does that, God will exalt not necessarily in this life, but in the life to come, which is to say, in eternity. But what greater exaltation is there than that? Eternal life, reserved exclusively for the humble. And that by God's sovereign doing and choosing and flipping on its head and reversing all of worldly wisdom and values like only he can do. And it's important to say even here that in spite of the support and large support that Mary gives here for the poor, this is not a license for liberation theology as some people have taken it in some circles. Where they say, this is a call to arms right here to fight on behalf of and for the poor. You gotta fight for them, to take up arms. That's not at all what Mary's saying here. That wasn't her intention. Yes, we need to care for and have compassion for the poor, and you see that especially in Luke's gospel, even more than Matthew, Mark, or John. You see the emphasis of Jesus having compassion on whom the world will not have compassion on, the women and the children and the orphans and the widows and the sick and the disease and the destitute. He does. But she's not encouraging political revolution here, like some have taken this as pretext for. No, not at all. She's remembering God's care for the poor. She's reflecting upon God who is just in this life and the next to give to everyone exactly what they're due. And then she finishes in closing by remembering specifically and praising God for what he has done for his people, Israel. And she says this in verse 54. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy 
as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. There's that same note again, mercy. She ended the first half of her song on the note of mercy in God's mercy, and now again she, she ends the second half on the note of God's mercy. He has helped to serve in Israel. He's remembered. He's helped. He's saved. And we saw earlier just how much he saved Israel throughout redemptive history by a sovereign hand, even when it seemed to be invisible. Sometimes miraculously, sometimes not. And he traces this all the way back to the first promise he made to Abraham in Genesis at the beginning of Israel's story. When Israel was born, when God plucks Abraham out of nowhere, out of Ur of the Chaldeans, he was a pagan, and he makes to him a promise in Genesis 12, and he says, I'm going to bless the nations of the world through you. Everyone will be blessed. The universal blessing that for those of us who are with us, going through the book of Galatians, we've seen Paul interpret in no uncertain terms as the promise of the gospel that God made to Abraham, which would be fulfilled through the offspring, the seed who is Christ. But a lot happened in history until the revelation and the advent of Christ. And so God had to help them. He had to save them. And when they were in slavery and bondage in Egypt, he helped them in his mercy. He saved them. And when they were in exile, first in Assyria and then in Babylon, he preserved and protected and help them in his mercy. And when they're on the brink of, of being annihilated, exterminated, genocide, as we saw earlier, God protected and preserved them and rescued them in his mercy because he made a promise to Abraham and a promise to David, and God cannot break his promises. And that's the note she finishes on. He spoke to our fathers and to Abraham. And what God has spoken will certainly come to pass. No one or nothing can thwart the purposes and the promises and the decrees of God. And notice the promise that he made to Abraham, that last word, and to Abraham's offspring, who's Christ, forever. Forever. Not temporarily. Not in the here and now, forever, for eternity. Exactly as the angel Gabriel said to Mary about the extent and the reign and the rule and the majesty of Jesus' kingdom, he will reign forever and there will be no end. Mary's response to the good news the angel Gabriel brought to her is, is one of faith. Faith and praise. She believes that God will do exactly as he said he would for and through her. For the world. Salvation. And she praises God, who in his infinite wisdom was pleased to do so in backwards logic by the world standards in choosing her to be the mother of Jesus, the Savior, Messiah, King. And she praises God for who he is, for what he's done for the poor and helpless, and for what he's done for Israel, and through Israel to extend salvation to the whole world. And he's done this all throughout salvation history in a series of humanly impossible, illogical, irrational reversals of human values and human outcomes. And if he has done the same for you and for me, how can we too respond in any other way but joyful, heartfelt praise and adoration like Mary? Because by sending his son to be born of a virgin, and to save us and change our eternal destiny by way of reversal from hell to heaven. This was all by his doing, for his glory and out of his grace.
Would you bow your heads with me?